We are moving on to some story now with Dot Walsh. Dot is from Dedham and she is peace chaplain and considers herself an educator for nonviolence. She served as lay team member in a prison chaplaincy in the Massachusetts prisons. And she's developed and implemented a number of programs over the course of 20 years. Excuse me. June 4th, 1988, she spent a day with Mother Teresa in the prisons, which then connected her to work at the Peace Abbey in Sherborne. And she has continued her work there as chaplain and program coordinator to this day, and also serves as intern supervisor for Harvard University students and board member for the Lionheart Foundation. And one thing in her very busy day, most people don't know about her, is that before she goes to the Peace Abbey, she goes to the gym to work out at 5.30 every morning. <laughs> and then she has found hard at work connecting with community, meeting with school children, women's sacred circle, the indigenous grandmothers, religious leaders, poets, artists, authors, traveling from all over the world, as well as people seeking personal asylum and retreat for their own coping and healing in life. She shows her compassion to all equally. Impressed by the depth and extent of how Dot reaches out to others, two students from a Boston college created a documentary film by the name of Beth Balaban and Eric Gulliver that focuses on Dot as one of two Boston area women who strive for peace in their work and daily life. And it is, the title is Peace in the Quiet. Mm -hmm. Dot also has a family she is happy to speak of and she tries to keep her time for family separate and sacred in her time away from work. But she sees the connection of both family at home and at world. And she notes, as a married woman and grandmother, I have a deep concern for the future of our planet and the quality of life for all beings. And Dot also added, my hope is that we can all learn to respect all life, both plant and animal, and in doing so, we will find the peace the world is so needing. Today, she will offer and debut some of her stories of her work at prisons, which she gives thanks to storyteller Alan O'Hare, her friend who is with us as well today, and got her started writing these one-page true stories of her experience in prison work where she learned and observed from her time there and how it might connect with our understanding and hope for those in prison systems and in the larger scope of the world. So with that, I look forward to the debut of stories. Please gently welcome up for the first time, Dot Walsh. The stories that I'm going to tell uh, are stories of many of my friends, the friends that I met in the prison system uh, over a number of years. And they, these are uh, people who don't have a voice. So I'm going to give them a voice today. Maybe some of you know how many people are in prison in the United States. A new article that was written in the New Yorker talks about the numbers being, let me just see there, 2.3 million in the United States. So we incarcerate, we're the first in the world for incarceration, more than China, more than any other country. And the cost in Massachusetts is 500 million per year, but that's only money. The real cost is the cost to all of us because we're all connected to one another. So I'd like to invite you, here, we're here in Hopkinton, not far from Walpole, where there's a maximum security prison, Norfolk medium security prison, the women's prison in Framingham. The state and the county, I've been in both um, of those institutions. <coughs> so the stories today are from the state prisons. And I'm going to allow a space 
in between each story so that you can absorb a little of the, the pain, the hope, and maybe become a little more familiar with this system. I know when I was introduced years ago to the Norfolk Fellowship, it was like opening a door that I couldn't close. I couldn't close it again because I couldn't believe that I never knew. I'm going to start with a story called Locked In. So just let's just open the veil and I welcome you to come in. For anyone visiting a maximum security prison, there are many regulations and checks and sometimes even body searches. Entering the front door, one is confronted with many signs that create fear. Family members undergo the harshest treatment. Staff members working inside the prison go through a series of locked doors with guards in the control room. Maximum security prisons have isolated locked areas within the prison. Keys are never left unattended. And if it happens, the punishment for this is severe. The sound of an alarm calls for staff to leave the locked areas and remain in the hallway. Inside the blocks, there are three tiers with a power controlled locking system. At least twice a week, I made a pastoral visit to the punishment areas. I was allowed to talk individually with inmates in a locked cell. This was an opportunity for a conversation, an exchange of ideas, a time to affirm one's sanity or to be present to insanity. For me, it sometimes all ran together. I could never reconcile the idea of people being rehabilitated in an environment that crushed the core of one's humanity. And yet, there were some who survived. The count. It seems rather archaic in a time of robots and high-tech industry, but according to the regulations, inmates are manually counted three times a day. This requires each person to stand at the bars as an officer moves through each cell on the tiers. There are no excuses. You have to be standing. Many a man has received a D report for refusing to stand for the count. Once the total is recorded and the men who might be in the hospital or some other area are accounted for and the numbers are called in, then the all clear buzzer goes off. There were times when the count was incorrect. Someone was missing. Was it an attempted escape or a mistake in the count? No one moved in the prison until the cause was determined. I remember the time a man was laid out on his cot with the covers over his head. It looked as if he was refusing to stand for the count. It wasn't until later that his murder was discovered. Imagine. Perhaps the reader would have some idea of what isolation is like. If you locked yourself in a small bathroom and had someone bring simple food three times a day and stayed there for three days, no open windows, no vent, no sunlight, just you with your thoughts and feelings. Periodically, I was allowed to go through security with some harmless but unusual items like leaves. It was the fall season, and everyone remembers walking and playing in the fallen leaves on the way to school. 
Oh, what fun. And so I did just that. I went down to the isolation unit and scattered the leaves on the floor by the cells and then walked down the aisle singing and kicking the leaves. Everyone wanted a leaf with its multicolored face. And yes, they all welcomed the remembrance of back then, wherever it was that they kicked and jumped in the leaves. It was a golden moment, a brief escape from the weariness and boredom of isolation. And I would tell you something about 10 Block. People that are put into isolation 10 Block are not, it's not because of the crime they've committed, it's because that um, they perhaps could not be controlled inside the prison. So they're put inside the prison, inside the prison. Guilt. He was young and timid, yet willing to tell me the explicit details of the fire he started and the loss of the person he loved. He hadn't meant for her to be trapped in the flames that snuffed out her life. He wanted her to forgive him, but she was gone. He only saw one solution, one answer that would ease his pain and his guilt, one way for him to be with her again forever. It was an easy choice. And if you um, pay attention to some of the statistics, um, I think this year is a record year for people who commit suicide inside the prisons. And the population inside prisons, there's more uh, people who are uh, mentally ill, who have serious um, issues that are not uh, attended to in, outside in the community, and so they end up inside the prisons. Good and evil. It always seemed easy to point fingers at those who are exposed as criminals in the newspaper, TV, radio. We could say, these are the evil ones, these are the bad ones, and we are the good ones, the respectable, the honorable, the exemplary. We are the ones who contribute to society, not those who destroy it. We are the nonviolent. They are the violent. Stop. Listen to those who have researched the brain and tell us that both, both violence and nonviolence reside in all of us. We are hardwired to both. How do we overcome this horrible truth? We nurture the nonviolence. We walk the path of compassion and cruelty-free living. We celebrate all that is truthful, kind, and loving. We seek to serve others respectfully and not ourselves, and we bring joy, light, and love into every moment of our lives. Is it possible to show others the path of nonviolence? And over the years, spending much of my time um, in the isolation areas, um, I came to make friends with many of the people there and have continu continu I've continued that friendship on the outside. There's a, a wonderful group that meets in Jamaica Plain. Um, we share a meal, and then uh, we share a circle in the Native American tradition and um, invite you all to join us on Monday night. Medication for the heart. 
As I walked into the secure section of the hospital unit, the smell of garbage and the noise reached me before I turned the corner. Four cells, two on each side, held four angry men. Not dismayed by the trash, I approached them and began with a little song, a big smile and my outstretched hand. I was greeted by grunts and questioning gazes. Who are you, lady? I came to read you a story about a fish, Walter Fish. It was a story about a fish that washes up on the beach and of the many people who pass by with various comments and nothing else. Finally, someone comes by and puts the fish back into the water. I could see that I had their attention. Perhaps they related it to their own situation. I used the bars in the cell to illustrate equality. In my eyes, no one was on the top bar or the bottom bar, but all were on the same bar, created equally. This did not depend on what one did or didn't do. It was God's gift. After listening to the individual stories, I left promising to return. All were quiet. As I turned the corner, the staff psychiatrist, who had been fearful of approaching the men, asked, what did you do? Nothing was my response. I just made a visit. Revenge. He hadn't meant for it to turn out this way. He was only trying with his broken English to try to make her understand his needs. Then he stepped over the line and now she was his hostage and the alarms went off. His hostage, a social worker, kept calm and within a very short time he released her. Punishment for him was isolation in 10 block until he was given a new sentence on top of the one he was serving. In 10 block, he kept to himself, not choosing to leave for his half hour from the cell. I remember the day the call came reporting a fire in his cell. The guard said the door was jammed and that the electronic device was not working and they couldn't get him out. He died. And we wondered what really happened. Many staff members felt he got what he deserved. The chaplaincy team buried him in Potter's Field. And right now in Massachusetts, the population, the majority of the people serving time are black and Latino. I have to say that um, this is my first time reading these stories and as Cheryl said that um, Alan is really my mentor. He encouraged me to write and um, I said, I can't write. And he said, read Eduardo Galeano from Uruguay. He writes a story on one page. And I said, mm, maybe I could do that. So I'm forever grateful to Alan because he <coughs> keeps saying, come on, and then Cheryl, same. So thank you, thank you. Okay. The Mouse and the Spiders. Ten Block fostered creativity in many ways. Pictures were posted on the walls with toothpaste, 
A piece of plastic spoon was used to carve a sculpture in a bar of soap. Then there were the unusual pets that took the place of domestic animals and helped fill the emptiness and the loss of nurturing. Jack had spiders in an empty milk carton. He was able to identify the male and female, and soon he was the proud uncle of a family of little ones. He watched over and cared for them with gentleness and love. Chris had a mouse, just an ordinary mouse that became a tamed and quite unusual mouse. On my visits to Ten Block, he would show me how smart this little mouse was with all his latest tricks. Perhaps no one outside the walls would call this a pastoral visit. To be present, to listen, to appreciate one man's attempt to survive the loneliness and despair ever present. There was no need to proselytize, only to share a simple prayer and a smile, transferring hope. And I'd like to close with, um, as Cheryl mentioned, I spent that day with Mother Teresa. And I had the wonderful, wonderful time of seeing my mother with Mother Teresa. So this is called Two Mothers. My mother was really upset knowing I would be escorting Mother Teresa around the prison and she would be lost in a sea of visitors invited to the event. I reassured her that there would be a way for her to get close. And then I had an idea. I bought one red rose and left it with my mother, telling her to wait for the right moment. The inmates were seated in the auditorium with the volunteers in the front row. I looked out from the stage, seeing my mother there. Mother Teresa sat beside me, listening to the introductions read by the inmate who had invited her to visit. Suddenly, he paused and looked at me, and then asked if Dot's mother, Sarah, would come up to the stage. Mother Teresa turned to me and asked, who is this woman? When she learned it was my mother, she jumped from her chair and ran across the floor to hug her. In the middle, standing tall, was one red rose. So thank you. Um, I. I have that picture, I, maybe you'd like to see it. My mother with Mother Teresa, which. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate this as um, I'm a novice and um, uh, so I appreciate being here today and for your support. Thank you. The sun is brilliant, and it was in May. And it was probably about 20 years ago, and I was in Boston attending a conference with other colleagues and professionals at the Copley Square Hotel. So I drove in there, I took the tea, and got in there, and the sun was shining, and the conference was inside the Copley Square Hotel, which is beautiful and magical and wonderful, and filled with 900 people in this large conference room. And the conference was wonderful and great and interesting and exciting and educational. And then we had lunch. We each took a sandwich, my friends, eight friends and I, and we said, let's go outside and eat. Maybe in the Copley Square Plaza and just sit there. And so we went out there and with our sandwiches, and we said, now nah, let's go over to the river, Charles River. And so we walked over to the Charles River and it was there, the river was flowing, and it was magical, the glistening light, and the sun was shining, and everybody was doing it. The boats were on the river, people were running and laughing, and children playing, and it was wonderful. And we sat there eating our lunch, and we had to be back by one o'clock. So we're eating our lunch, and it was 1.15, and it was 1.30, and it was 1.45, and it was 2 o'clock, and we were still not eating our lunch, but eating our companionship, our friendship, our joy in being with each other. It was 2.30, quarter of three, and somebody said, should we go back? Nah. 
because that's where the conference was taking place for the eight of us, because we were surrounded by the world. It was all happening right there. It was wonderful. And I, I just remember sitting there and, and just absorbing this. Oh, could anything be better? And I remember saying to all these people in a moment of silence, the eight of us, and we talked about everything under the sun, some things profound, some things ridiculous, some things obscene, some things strange and wonderful, but there we were. And I sat back on the grass and looked. And I said, wouldn't it be great if life were like this? <laughs> And somebody across the way, Chuck said to me, what'd you say, Alan? I said, wouldn't it be great if life were like this? And he said, Alan, it is. <laughs> so today, so thank you for making today like this. A symphony of sounds, dew blankets the earth. Moon gently rising, sun slowly sinking. Evening shadows emerge, animals return to their resting places. People gather round. Today's web has been spun. Peach and pear.